I'm very happy to be with Naomi Wallace, who is a Kentucky-born dramatist with an international reputation. She's won numerous awards, her plays have been staged all over the world, and she writes with poetic grace about class, oppression, and alienation. And her latest play, The Breach, is now being staged at Hampstead Theatre. So, welcome to Hampstead, Naomi. Thank um, you. I don't want to give the plot away, but we see how a pact that four Kentucky teenagers make in 1977 has a dramatic effect on their later lives. So, can I ask you, what was the trigger for this play? I would say that this play is probably closer to me in a certain way. I mean, all the plays are, I, I feel close to, but because it was the time I was a teenager. And to be frank, um, I had a group of friends that we were very close. We ran together, we drank together, everything. Got arrested together, got in trouble together, wrecked cars together. And some would have said, some people would say we were a rough crowd, but I like to think of it that we were kids looking for the kind of home we didn't really find in our own families. So we created a home, we created families. By the time I was in my early 30s, I'd say half of those young people I was with were dead, either by suicide um, or overdose. And so that period in my life has haunted me for a long time. Um, in a good way of just thinking about the energy and imagination and joy that these young people had who in a way believed in the American dream that we were all gonna we were gonna have our good time in high school and then we were gonna go out and make our worlds and what happened to a lot of us is that the world made us and in ways that weren't always of our own choosing so in a way the breach is a coming-of-age story but I really wanted to look at the people when they were young and then about um, 13 years later, when they're grown up, when their lives are s somewhat settled and how different they were as people. You mentioned that 13 year gap because it, the play starts in 1977 and then it switches to 1991 and yes. then goes backwards and forwards. Yes. So fluidity of time is important in this play. Is that essential to you as a dramatist, playing with time in the theatre? You know, it is, uh, you know, your word fluidity, it's like I feel like the, the past and the present that there's, a, there's always an active, almost kind of liquid relationship between the two, back and forth, and how in our lives the past at times can seem far more present and relevant or alive inside us um, than, than the present moment. And so I wanted to, the structure of it and how it goes back and forth between 1991 and 1997, there's a kind of bleeding that happens between those times. It's a play obviously about gender. There's one girl in the play, Jude, and three boys, one of the boys being her younger brother. The other two boys lust after her. But it's very much a play about class, it seems to me. One of the boys is called Hoke and he's got a rich father and that's very significant in the action of the play. Are you still angered by the privileges that money and class can enjoy? Well, you know, nowadays we're not supposed to say we're angry, are we? We're why, investigating. Why, not? why can't we say we're that? Not, we're investigating. You know, the, um, class, um, social relationships have always been something that, I've, that have inspired me. To look at how we live, we live in a culture that that so, focuses so much on individualism and the individual as though the individual is all powerful and that things like class, um, race, um, gender are, are secondary in some way. And so how I, what I experienced growing up was that when we were young, we, we were all together. This was in Kentucky, of course, but I imagine that that holds true for others as well. Um, we, we, we didn't care about, we felt we didn't care about class. It's like whose ever house was whose ever house. If their parents were out, we'd have a party that weekend there. Mm -hmm. But as we grew older and some of us went off up east, we call it, to college out of state in Kentucky. Others stayed and didn't go to college. They went straight to work. And when we all came back together, something had happened, something had been breached in a way, and, and we were never the same when we were together again, and after a while we weren't together again at all. But, but yes, class has always interested me because I feel it's a powerful force that we often place after 
who a person is as an individual. Again, without giving too much away, there are, I think, three offstage deaths in your play, and at least two of them are related to industrial negligence and poverty. I mean, again, is that something that uh, gnaws away at you, the fact that America is still an under-unionized society and workers are not protected? You know, it, I like your expression. It does gnaw away at me. I think in doing some of the work I've done in the past for plays like Slaughter City or Things of Dry Hours, you know, I often have a process of interviewing people involved in the labor that I'm writing about. And I was always struck by how often what happens in the workforce, what happens in our daily work, we don't leave behind. We bring home, let's say, for instance, you're working at a mechanical job and you develop carpal tunnel syndrome. You go home and that affects if you can pick up your child. That affects if you, how you touch your lover or your husband or your wife. Um, and so that's always fascinated me. It's not really one over the other, but it's about how social and historical forces play themselves out through our most intimate relationships. That's fascinating because I think it's fair to say you are an openly political dramatist. Is that a lonely occupation in the United States? No, I, I would certainly say not anymore. I mean, that's the type, you know, for me, I'm just interested in the things I'm interested in. I would say that in the United States in the last, you know, 10 years or more, there's far more playwrights who are willing to say that they're political, they're writing about social issues, you know, um, and, and that all comes from, you know, queer movements, Black Lives Matter movements, you know, movements against injustice. And I think playwrights are feeling much more, rather than being sidelined for being political, are, are at this point, uh, welcomed for that. So that's something. I, I don't know what the situation is really here, although as a playwright, when I was younger, I found that um, British theater was far more open to my, my writing than, than American theater was. Well, that's fascinating because, of course, a lot of your um, successes have been here, haven't they? And I mean, a lot of your career early on, your plays were done by the Bush, the Finborough, Southwark Playhouse, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, you also have a home, I think, in North Yorkshire, do you not? Yes. Um, is there something about, uh, uh, first of all, British theatre and secondly, British society that makes you feel more comfortable than you are back home? You know, I, I feel very indebted to British theatre and specifically the theatres who produced my work in the beginning, specifically the Bush Theatre under Dominic Dromgoul way back when. Um, because it was never an issue, I was never really called a political playwright. It was like, this is what she's writing about, and, and some, some of them said, and we really like this. I'm not sure how much of a career I'd have if it weren't for British theater. My partner is British, and I've lived here now for um, over 20 years in North Yorkshire. But I will say that I wrote this play, The Breach, looking at the North Yorkshire landscape from my workshop. And I have, I, when I first moved here, I thought, how will I write about when I place a play in my own country? But I've actually found that through living in North Yorkshire, through living in England, I have come, been able to come closer to my past by being far away from Kentucky, by having this distance, I suppose. It was, it's never been a problem. It's like the ghosts come, you know, wherever one is. You mentioned some of your play titles. Um, they cover an enormous amount of territory. That's what strikes me looking at your work as a whole. You mentioned One Flea Spare. Well, that's set in a plague ravaged London in 1665. Uh, Things of Dry Hours is about black communists in the Alabama of the 1930s. In the heart of America, I read again only yesterday, is about an Arab American woman trying to find out what happened to her brother who's gay during the Gulf War. I mean, the range of subjects historically geographically is very wide C can you pin down what dictates your choice of a subject and a period you know i have always been interested in conflict and war mm -hmm. whether it's wh whether it comes home like it does in some ways in the breach or whether it's abroad um, uh, some of the writings that i've done about uh, the u.s wars in the middle east but as corny as it sounds, most of my plays, they're about um, intimate relationships. They're about love and it's in its many forms. I would say that that is one of the cores of my writing and how 
social forces, forces divide us from one another. That's always fascinated me, you know, that, that we, think, we think we're in control of our lives and then these things happen that knock us off the path and we think we can get back to where we wanted to be, but by then we're transformed. So I, I mean, for me being, I guess one would say an American writer, I'm not even sure how I feel about that term. But how could I, I didn't, I'm interested in writing about history. I'm not sure how I could have written about domestic stories in the United States without writing about um, the foreign wars. Because to me, there's an inter, a very intim, intimate interrelationship between U.S. wars and what happens at home, what happens in our living rooms, what happens in our, in our very homes, what happens to our bodies. So those things were always connected to me. So therefore, I wrote about um, the Middle East wars in various plays, uh, but at the same time, the breach is, the war is very much in the background. It's hardly mentioned, but it's there, the Vietnam War. Yes, as far as in every single one of your plays, it is in the background, the war. Um, it's interesting what you say, because another critic uh, wrote in a dictionary of one of your plays, your plays all love stories at heart revealing a fascination with how the human body can experience both exquisite desire and acute pain. I assume that's a definition you would recognize. Yes, yes. And that's another thing that has, as, is, inter has always interested me is desire and who we're allowed to desire, how we're allowed to desire a person, where, how we're allowed to touch them, how we're not allowed to touch them. And then how does, how does class figure into that? How does race, how does gender figure into that? Um, and what are the forces that oppress our desires? But one thing that's always interested me, that is always there, is how we resist what diminishes us. And that is what I've always looked for. No matter what forces bear down on us, how we resist that force that may be crushing us or deforming us. And that inspires me. And you know, I've been told before that my plays are somewhat dark. You know, it would not be too far-fetched to say, I see all my plays as dark, dark comedies. They're full of humor, at least what I think is funny. And they're full of just the joy of being alive for people, no matter what their situation, the joy of being in love, of, of desire, of, of being with those that you love. One shouldn't slap labels on people, but I was looking at what I wrote myself, a play of yours called away. Slaughter <laughs> City, which you remember well, set in a Louisville slaughterhouse in which the RSC did in 1996. And I looked up my review and I said, it united two American traditions, the radical and the mystic, and that it had echoes of Walt Whitman. Uh, again, do you recognize that description of yourself? I appreciated or not? you mentioning Walt Whitman. Ah. Yes, I do. I think that was very apt, what you said there um, about combining those traditions. And I think, I mean, one thing that my plays are not is naturalistic, and this goes back to the fluidity. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ghosts in my plays. And um, I think this, this, again, has to do with our past. And that's what I love about the stage, that that the dead can actually come back in living bodies. There's nothing else that does that. And that the dead can stand next to the living um, as characters and they're, they're alive and they're vibrant, if not more alive and vibrant than the living. And I love that about theater. It's a unique quality of theater, isn't it? Absolutely. Actually? The, the interaction and nothing of... else is like that, yeah. Can I ask one last final difficult question? <laughs> Why, in the last analysis, do you think you write plays? Is it to change society, to raise awareness? I mean, can you analyze your motives? Can I analyze my motives? Um, well, I don't mean to be glib here, but there's not a lot that I'm good at. I'm not even sure how good I am at writing plays, but there is something about, um, I love actors and like I said before, about bringing the past to life of things that, that have not happened uh, in the real world, that, that one can make them happen on stage. And within that is the dream of um, other worlds, maybe other economies that wouldn't be so damaging to our spirits, to our bodies, um, worlds where we're more free, where there's not such disparity between working people and the super wealthy. A world where, yes, these, where the earth 
where we have an economy that's not destroying the earth. Those things affect all of us. They may sound like big words, but you know, I have children, I have friends, I have people that I love, and these things do concern me. Why I chose theater, I think, is because, as cliche as it is, there is, there's to me an, an absolute and intimate magic about having the past on stage and making it feel alive in this moment. It's like we can bring everything back to us, everything that we've lost, we can look at it again and we can think, were there other choices that we could have made and it would have turned out differently? And that's not nostalgia. That's, to me, what will we choose next? Naomi Wallace, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me. My pleasure.